Who are you? What are you doing here? Are you supposed to be doing that? Is this really who you are? <laughs> These are the questions I think that a lot of us can understand both from regular life, but also of course our virtual lives. And in our virtual lives, it's a little harder because our identity is purely digital. It's purely based on information. We're hearing a lot of things about identity management, about pass keys, about passwords, about AI. How do we bring these things together without identity management giving us more and more neuroses? That's the question on this episode of the On-Premise IT Podcast. Welcome to the On-Premise IT Podcast, the only show that dares to be both on topic or on premise and on location. Yes, we are on location at the ISS Summit in Cleveland, on premises. I'm Stephen Foskett from Gestalt IT, and today we are talking about identity management and how it's tweaking our neuroses. But before we begin, let's meet who's on the panel today. So I'm Bob Kelka. I'm a global lead for IBM Security. I've been working on security for 29 of my 34 years at IBM. And I'm Leon Adato. I'm a principal technical evangelist at Kentic.com. And I have been doing tech stuff for 35 years, mostly focused on monitoring and observability. But also, security bleeds in there. And I'm Stephen Foskett. Uh, my background is in enterprise tech. And of course, if we've been in enterprise IT for a while, security is everywhere. Uh, I don't claim that this is my focus, though, so that's why it's really exciting for me to be at an event like this where I can meet with uh, security professionals and learn from them. Um, who are you? What's going on? I mean, that's what identi identity management is all about, right? And unfortunately, that's also the root of a lot of problems, right, Bob? It, it is indeed. Um, you know, when I started in cyber uh, 29 years ago, I started working with clients from day one, and I started noticing that you would walk into a client and they would know the right thing to do, but they wouldn't do it. And that confused me, so I ended up going at night to grad school uh, at Syracuse, and I got a master's degree in organizational psychology. <laughs> And I will tell you that in my 29 years of cyber, I've used that degree far more than my computer science degree. I'm, I'm actually with you there. My degree is in sociology. Uh, I studied urban planning with a focus on society and technology interaction. I'm the only STS major from WPI uh, <laughs> that year. But it, again, just like you, that has become so critical because the whole idea of what technology does to us as people and as a society, it really illuminates what's going on in the world. And Leon, I mean, you're all over this. Right. Now, I, as far as degrees go, you you both have me. I have a degree in theater. So that, that oh, one does better. Right. <laughs> Well, it's a, We're all you know, on stage every day. Well, yeah, it definitely helps with this kind of stuff. But uh, I, I think that under, all security comes back to human behavior, and all identity management comes back to human behavior, both on building tools and solutions that allow people to to do what they need to do to do the daily work without with the least amount of friction, but also create friction where you don't want them to go or make it harder to do the wrong thing. Um, but all security conversations seem to boil down to, are we trying to help good people not screw up or are we trying to stop bad people from doing bad things? Right. And I'm not sure whether identity management as a category has an opinion about that. It's trying to do all things or it's it's definitely focused in one way or another. Well, you're hitting on a huge, huge point that I run into every single day. And just by way of introduction, I just hit 9 million miles with American Airlines. <laughs> and, okay. and that's doing nothing but flying around the globe constantly, meeting with clients on this topic, right? So the one thing that ties into what all of, uh, all of us have said so far is the simple fact that the reason this topic is so hard is because the security team doesn't fully own the problem. Well, they may own the problem, but they don't own the solution. Most things in security where the security team does things themselves, like run the security operations center and put in security analytics tools and look for bad guys trying to come in, they own that. Mm -hmm. They don't have to collaborate with anyone for that other than, hey, can send me your logs and stuff and your flows. But identity management forces them to actually have to constantly be collaborating with everybody else that has way other goals. And as a result, they struggle to make progress on it. 
So for example, I just spent, uh, I had about five sessions with collectively 150 CISOs in the last month talking about this topic. And the first hour was the CISOs uh, talking about what their struggles are right now. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that the list of issues they brought up around identity management is the same list that it was back in 2005. <laughs> Proof that even though they've spent a lot of money and done a lot of work and expanded a lot, they haven't actually addressed this thing, which by the way is probably a starting point for neuroses. Right. If you keep banging your head trying to make progress and that you feel like you never get ahead of it, that's going to cause a neurosis. Right. And you're, it's from a therapeutic standpoint, from a therapy standpoint, yeah. you're not addressing the root cause, you're not being honest with yourself, you're not, uh, you know, you're not, you, you have the wrong approach, I right. mean, all that right. stuff. Right. So, right. And, and I think also with identity management specifically, the, the tools keep shifting, not the identity management tools necessarily, but the things that people are trying to get done. Again, keeping good people from doing bad things, okay, but when you have a uh, document management tool du jour, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden sudden you have a workflow management or a project management tool or whatever it is and these are shifting on a six month to 18 month basis or the tools themselves keep changing identity management str uh, systems struggle to keep up with that and struggle to address the gaps well yeah and you just brought up two killer points so number one is that in organizational psychology step one is allow yourself to face reality Right, because in in human psychology, of course, everybody's got. If you're in the Jungian, uh, Jungian stuff, everybody's got a shadow of stuff that they believe about themselves. They're not really thrilled about it, and so they don't focus on it because you'd be miserable if you thought about it all the time. Right? Uh, organizational psych psychology is the exact same thing, as that an organization has beliefs about itself, mm -hmm. right, and how they operate. And in this case, for example, there is this 20 to 25 year neurosis around. Well, we've got to say we've got our act together on identity management, but we know we don't, but we've got to say we do. Because the stockholders will revolt. Well, well and the, uh, my bosses will revolt when they say, wait a minute, you spent that $6 million and I thought that was going to solve everything and it's actually a little worse now? Yeah, it's, it's this emperor's clothes problem that honestly a lot of us have. Um, you know, I don't want to spill any beans here, but I think that our audience understands because we're all, you know, IT tech people. Um, None of the emperors are wearing any clothes. I mean, right. frankly, right, right. no matter what right, topic right. we're talking about, you're going to get neurotic about it the more you know about it because you're going to realize the, the, the weaker and weaker our solutions are for those things and the, and the bigger gaps there are because it's, you know, there, there's just so many problems here. Um, can we step back for a second um, in case somebody's not aware, what is identity management and why is it driving us crazy? Yeah, how do I manage, uh, how do I identify and manage who can get into my systems? What can they do once they get there? And can I clean them up when they don't need that access or oh even gosh. to be around anymore? Talk about neurotic. Right. Yeah, the the cleanup piece, you know, and and not just, you know, an employee left and, you know, I need to make sure that they don't have it, but also their role changed. That, you know, um, you know, Sally from the mailroom is now Sally in accounting and in a couple of years it's going to be Sally the CFO. <laughs> and yes, you're right. That is I just described an increasing level of responsibility, but Sally the CFO shouldn't have access to the mailroom systems anymore as much as she's a beloved historic character in the company. And how do you maintain an manage that and I'm talking about the, the processes to even let people know that yeah. those moves have happened and even simpler things about people shifting on teams doing pretty much the same job different team different systems shouldn't have access to this but so many companies have people with legacy access it's like uh, oh don't worry about that I'll get you that access because I still have my logins I still have the and, and this is the plot of so many movies <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, you know, you watch you exactly. watch a television show, you watch a movie, and uh, somebody snags somebody's badge to get into the secure area, 
or somebody changes the codes to lock somebody out of the secure area, or somebody's pretending to be somebody else. You know, I mean, how many heist films do they need to? You know, they need the the, the, the janitor's cards, and how many and how many times does that janitor's card get them into the most secure area of right. the building? Because of course they're janitors, right? That's what they do. So I think that people can really understand what identity management is uh, by using these kind of real world analogs. Yeah. Or think about transportation security and you know getting on a plane or whatever, you know, you flash that card, how do I know that's really you? Uh -huh. How do I know you're really allowed to come through here? How do I know that you're not a bad actor? You know, and it's the same in cybersecurity. And I think the more people realize this, the more they realize why this is driving us crazy, because just like in the physical world, if somebody um, uh, subverts the, the thought, the, the, the cause of identity management, basically they can do all sorts of things. So I'm going to ask the question, you know, going back to transportation, so much of what we, and I'm going to say it out loud, and I apologize if I offend people, so much of what we see moving through an airport is security theater, not mm -hmm. actual security. So my question to you Very is, much. how much of identity management is identity management theater? Oh, right, well, well look, I mean, <laughs> you nailed it. So when we're in our lives and we're trying to do something, but we know there's some problems out there, but we choose not to look at them, mm -hmm. it causes us to do some weird things sometimes. The thing you just brought up about legacy is exactly that, is that everybody knows that, oh, I'll give you a really techie example. So everybody's putting multi-factor authentication, right? MFA in front of everything because it's more secure. And yet, everyone that's putting in multi-factor authentication is fully aware that their company is full of legacy apps home, with a homegrown written side file of identity <laughs> management support that the people who wrote it aren't even around anymore. If uh -huh. they are, they're ready to retire and they get nervous. And they're going, I know I can't even apply MFA against that let alone kind of a new trend towards behavioral risk-based MFA, right. which is where you uh, literally, for anyone that connects to you, you build a risk profile and continuously update it every time they interact with you. You leveraging, for example, AI, we'll get there, won't we? And leveraging AI to build a behavioral risk-based view of how someone operates. Like for example, one of my favorite things going on right now is that the state of the art of the technology has gotten to the point that let's say I'm using my identity to authenticate to you for the 276th time. And I'm on the same device from the same, well, it wouldn't be the same location for me, but you get the point. Right. Same device configured in the same way from the same location, the general, same general time of day. That's generally how MFA works, right? You'll base it on that. But what if I'm building a behavioral profile that includes how do I actually type? on that device. Okay. What is my speed of my typing generally? And what is it range based on the time of day that is? And what's my error rate based on the time of day? You can get to the point behaviorally where you say, you know what? If I analyze Bob's typing on this 277th time he's authenticating to me. I think this me, is Bob. It's, well, either Bob has had a couple of drinks before he showed up to work today, yep. right? Or that's not Bob, so let's kick in another factor. Mm -hmm. That's an example, right, mm -hmm. of addressing the neurosis through deeper insight of how do people learn. That's an example of applying AI, by the way, against IAM. So, but the problem that I have is, as I think as information security professionals would understand, that that the more you try to uh, over-engineer the plumbing, the easier it is to stop up the drain, as Mr. Scott said. <laughs> um, and, and this is the problem, right? Because you know, you, you we bring in all these systems, we bring in all these tools, but the more you understand the root the root systems, the more you neurotic about the whole problem you're going to become, right? Yeah, so, so oh gosh, the, you guys are bringing <laughs> all these things to mind. Okay, so personally what people do, right, is the way people with neuroses get healthy is they realize that their life is a, is a fabric of relationships. Okay. And that you actually see those relationships for what they are, not what you want them to be, what you think they are, whatever. Mm -hmm. And in identity management today, the hottest thing as of a year ago, at, look at all the analysts, what they're saying is fabric, the identity fabric. That's the hot trend right now because the identity fabric says you all have convinced yourselves that you can get to one identity provider in one directory. But you know what? We're in a hybrid world. No, you can't. 
So if you face the reality that instead of worrying about managing my identity against this one IDP, identity provider, one directory, because mm -hmm. then I can blank out everything else I don't want to see that even though it's there, like the legacy apps we were just talking about, right. right? Instead, how do I manage this across multiple IDPs and multiple directories? I had a client three weeks ago say, you know, Bob, I thought I solved this. I've standardized an active directory for my directory. And guess what? I have a team managing active directory on-prem. Mm -hmm. I have a second team managing Active Directory in Azure, mm -hmm. and I have a third team managing Active Directory in AWS. And surprise, the Active Directory in the cloud is not the same thing at Correct. all. Correct. <laughs> and so they're going, I thought I had this solved. So once again, the, this idea of facing reality is it is an identity fabric. And if we acknowledge that, then we start getting healthier about how we start addressing it. All right, so I'm going to bring in another therapy concept, which is that <laughs> You know, okay, so so I, the C the 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 CIO, uh, the CSO, have come to terms with the reality of the situation. And I recognize that it is not single sign-on, it is multiple sign-on, and that is a fabric of identity. And yet all the people in my family circle aren't okay with the fact that I'm getting healthy, that I'm going to therapy. Oh, because nice. it's causing them to have to face nice. their so in this case the them are the users. What happens when a company's desire to have healthier behaviors in terms of identity management comes clashing up against the culture of the users who continue to try to push back to the old the old dysfunctional way. You are explaining why I have not had it and I'm with clients every single day. I have not had a briefing this year that the term passwordless mm -hmm. didn't come up. Mm -hmm. Because that addresses that, at least on the surface right now, is that from the user's point of view, I want better security, but I want you to stay out of my way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You would think at its inception that is a flawed concept, but it's not. So what everybody's calling passwordless, there's you know the concept of FIDO2 pass keys, yes. right? That I can get on my phone, use Face ID, and get access to my corporate apps. Okay. Right? That's passwordless. It's more secure, but it's easier for the users. Right. That's why it's such a craze right now, because people are going, wait a minute, I like this better and it actually is better. Than it what feels we it feels putting my thumb on the MacBook, you know, is exactly. a lot easier than than having to type exactly. in Correct horse battery staple. Exactly. And and just like in the real world, essentially what you're doing is you're bringing, bringing a trusted person with you everywhere you go to vouch for who you are. So you walk into the bank and there's the, you know, there's your lawyer standing next to you that says, yes, this really is Bob. You can give him his access to his accounts. And and we're going to agree that that trusted source, meaning, yeah. you know, the... Yeah. Or multiple trusted sources that on the back end you're trying to manage to yep. keep consistent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. If you forgot about those legacy apps and just manage them manually, guess what? If you're not manually keeping everything in sync, then you're going to have problems. Right. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say next. Okay, so we got this licked right. Pass keys, we're done. We're well, good. Uh, no, that just solves that one issue okay. of the user access, but yeah. yeah. But on the back end, you're still managing identities in multiple places. That's why, by the way, the hot topic uh, around that is what's called identity orchestration. Mm -hmm. How, uh, everybody orchestrates things. How do you orchestrate the fact that me, being represented by this identity is represented in five different ways in the five different identity systems I'm in. Well, How can I orchestrate that and automate it to keep it consistent and effective? Yeah. Well, but that's taking ownership because that was that was happening. In reality, but that was happening before. It's just that we had we had pushed that responsibility on the user. You know, <laughs> they right. were responsible for remembering, and yes. and we would laugh about people having a sticky note on their thing, or they had the same password for everything, or wh whatever other bad behaviors that we've talked about ad nauseum for years now. <laughs> that was the user doing it, and so we've taken as identity management professionals, we've taken ownership of that reality, and now we're going to manage the back end of it. And I'm actually okay with that because. Yeah. Have we taken ownership? Well, okay, we want to take, I mean, what we are talking we about should is, yeah. Take ownership. And I for think it. that that heterogeneousness mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, I in monitoring, I have pushed back against the idea of one solution fits up. One solution doesn't fit most, exactly. let alone one solution fits all. <laughs> exactly. You know, in terms of monitoring, that you're going to have multiple monitoring tools, you're going to have multiple document tools, you're going to have multiple, I mean, you're going to, you try to keep it to a reasonable, a number, but I think that with identity, with identity 
orchestration yeah. systems. On the yeah. back end, you recognize that there's going to be multiple things we have to bolt into. Yeah, it's just a brilliant thought because what happens is the reason the neurosis is out there that I'm really going to get to one identity provider, I promise, is that is that facing the reality that I've got to manage the fabric is a lot harder and the identity problem is already hard because of the fact that I have to constantly collaborate with all the different business lines and all the different systems mm -hmm. that once again their goal is not to help me on identity management right. their goal is stay out of my way dude right I gotta make a sale my job but keep me out of trouble yeah Right? And, and so, exactly. So it's, it's, we get the neuroses that, oh yeah, one will be that, but we know it won't, but we can't accept that it's not. Right. And so that's why what we have to do is face the reality that let's manage the fabric. And, and I think that right there, Bob, that, that is the, the core of this whole discussion, that identity, it's tweaking our neuroses because we understand, I think we fundamentally understand the limits of what is practical, of what users will accept, of um, what you know, we can and can't do with this technology, and yet, and yet, that there is this demand from literally everyone everywhere that we address this this problem. So, just let's let's uh, you know, kind of come to a summary here. You know, how, identity management is tweaking our neuroses. How do we how do we get therapy for this? What is the therapy for this problem? Yeah. So the way to face reality is that first you have to be able to see reality, mm -hmm. and then you have to accept that reality. Right. right? Basic human reality there. So what uh, can help us see that reality is AI. And I'll give you two examples in identity management. First is that thing I was just mentioning of building and constantly maintaining a risk score based on behavior in someone. AI engines can do that. And so that's really, really cool. What AI engines can also do is not only that piece of what is the risk score for this person, but then look at the actual activities and find the out of parameter stuff faster than we ever, ever, ever could. Right? So in fact, there's a new cool term. Uh, you know, we get what, two to three new acronyms a year in yeah. cyber, At right? Least, yeah. And this year, one of the hot ones is ITDR, Identity Threat Detection and Response. Google okay. it, you see a bunch of startups doing it. What is Identity Threat Detection and Response? Well, where does everybody see reality for security? Most people would say, well, that's my security analytics tool or my SIM tool in the SOC, right? In the Security Operations Center. And, uh, but guess what? Every SIM out there, including ours, has a blind spot on identity behavior. Mm -hmm. They don't see it. So guess what? There is a whole new class of technologies being developed, leveraging AI called ITDR, Identity Threat Detection Response, that finds the identity-related vectors and then feeds it into the curators of the world and the others that are out there, right? And, um, and it's totally cool, but it's brand new. Right? So that's an example of using AI to see reality, but then we still have to accept it right? and look at it and say, okay, I'm going to take an action that I know is harder than I want it to be, that I'm not really prepared to take, but I have to because otherwise I'm going to stay with the Tunnel Legacy apps, not using modern authentication mechanisms, and manually auditing them and manually managing them knowing that I have blind spots everywhere. Right. I, I think that, to your point, you know, you can't fix a problem unless you admit that you have the problem in the first place. And, and this is it. And I think that, again, recognizing that heterogeneous, that there are going to be multiple tools for multiple places. But to your point about AI, its ability to identify the unknown unknowns, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, do yeah, yeah, yeah. Massive, to do pattern recognition on massive volumes of data yeah. um, of disparate types is the hallmark of where machine learning really can be very can be very strong and i see that from the monitoring and observability standpoint of things that you know you've got data coming from all sorts of kinds of systems and you're looking for those unique those high cardinality yeah, events yeah, yeah, yeah. and identity management is just another data set with another set of uh, high cardinality events and if we recognize that then we have a path forward oh, here's the danger though the danger is, and, and you see this as you go through the years in life, you start seeing this with friends and stuff. It's one thing to see the problem 
it, it's a whole other thing to actually do something about it versus rationalizing it away. Right. Right. I'm sure in our lives you meet people, they find out that mom and dad were never around, and so I'm going to be miserable and feel bad, but they never do anything about it. And they just tell you that all the time. And you go, okay, that's good, but you're not growing. Right. But if you should take that fact, by the way, mom and dad were there for me, so thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks, mom. <laughs> thanks, mom. Thanks, dad. <laughs> right? But the point is, is that if you just rationalize it instead of actually doing something about it, then it just continues to feed the neuroses. So we have to let AI show us the stuff and other things, right? But then we actually have to have the guts to do something. Right. You have to recognize that what it's telling you is impassionate and unbiased and true. Yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah, and yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. And it's not a blight upon the organization. You're learning and growing in the same way that your sales patterns help you learn and grow and address those things. Identity management, security should be no different. Amen. So, I, I, great conversation. Um, as uh, the b former host of an AI podcast, um, I completely agree. I, I think that the, the challenge with AI is that people are trying to throw it at every problem, yeah. but it, it really is uniquely, machine learning specifically, is uniquely yeah. suited yeah. to sorting through a huge volume of data and spotting patterns and spotting things that don't fit the pattern. And I think that that really makes a lot of sense with I identity management. Also, I think that the thing uh, about identity management that that you that y'all are bringing up is is incredibly important as well is to recognize the shortcomings of these systems and recognize that it's not so simple as saying this person has the the code so therefore we can let them do whatever they want. This person knows the password so they uh, can come in. It, there's a lot more to it than that, oof. and this goes beyond this. We don't have time for that conversation right now. That's too bad. I'm ready to go. <laughs> That's great. Well, where can people connect with you and continue the conversation, Bob? Oh, get in touch on Twitter at Bob Kelka, LinkedIn, Bob Kelka, K A L K A I B M, um, and uh, look forward to continuing the discussion. Okay, and uh, my name's Leon Adato, and so you can find me at Leon Adato in almost every social media platform, and also adatosystems.com, and also kentic.com. And as for me, I'm Stephen Foskett from Gestalt IT. You'll find me uh, weekly on the On-Premise IT podcast, as well as our weekly Gestalt IT tech news rundown on Wednesdays. And of course, you'll find a lot of content out there on gestaltit.com and other social media platforms. And as you guys mentioned, LinkedIn is really where a lot of this conversation is happening now, so check out LinkedIn. Also check out Security Field Day, uh, which is gonna be happening real soon here, uh, another Gestalt IT production, where we're gonna be talking about various aspects of security. Uh, and of course, uh, tune in for the rundown and the uh, on-premise IT podcast in your favorite podcast platform. This podcast is brought to you by GestaltIT.com, your home for IT coverage from across the enterprise. For show notes and more episodes, go to GestaltIT.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you next week. 